Okay, so um, yeah, hi everyone from a very wet and uh, windy Ireland at the moment. Um, so this is a, a, a new project that myself and Pete have been sort of, well, thinking about and kind of working on over the sort of last six months or so around the role of um, transnational um, labor activists. Um, and we're kind of particularly interested in sort of shifting our attention away from um, uh, kind of individual uh, organizations to focus down onto the actors who are employed within these organizations um, and the kind of the levels and kind of arenas in which these activists operate um, and how they kind of motivate uh, collective uh, collective action. Um, so why do we why are we kind of looking at, at, uh, at transnational um, labor activists? Well, um, the main thing is around the kind of the, the failure of, of hard governance, really, and, and the rise of these new kind of uh, vertical forms of, um, of governance across borders. Um, and alongside of that, the kind of rise of um, NGOs and, and different kind of civil society organizations and other kind of actors who are involved in the kind of uh, better work scene, to put it in a way, um, has kind of created new, um, uh, oh, sorry, just said that I was signed out, but hopefully I'm still, uh, I'm still here. Pete, I'm, I'm still, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, so these yeah, NGO civil societies are creating kind of new avenues for um, experimentation, um, and uh, which maybe also created uh, higher degrees of complexity and and uh, opportunities for um, contradiction. So, you know, labour now needs to kind of act at many different levels and many different arenas and along various uh, networks of action away from the kind of nation state. So we're interested in, in, when we think about transnational labor activists, we're interested in, in those who, well, our kind of primary focus is around those who work for international trade union organizations and um, those who work with the international labor organization. Now, international trade unions are obviously nothing new, um, but there has been this kind of emergence of a new internationalism where unions are focusing kind of less on the, on the state and more kind of engaging perhaps directly with employers through different kind of coalitions or working with human rights uh, organizations or, or other kind of civil society organizations. Um, so they kind of, their role has sort of expanded over time, which requires new and kind of expanding skill sets for those who work for these organizations. So, you know, it's it, roles such as advocacy, representation, for example, in, in international arenas such as the ILO, um, industrial coordination, uh, for example, the signing of global framework agreements being perhaps the most um, sort of emblematic example of this. And there were some great presentations a couple of days ago on 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 GAFs, uh, on global framework agreements. Sorry, um, and a coalition building, trying to uh, seek kind of shared interests with NGOs and other organisations that might share kind of a similar interest and similar targets, and also the elevation of, of campaigns across um, borders at well, uh, as well. So these officials require, you know, very different sort of skill sets, not least often extensive kind of language skills, but to be able to um, elevate different uh, issues and also operate in these different um, arenas. So we're focusing here on, on sort of focusing today on uh, global union federations as a kind of type of international union, which is particularly complex, mainly because of its structure as, as a meta organization, as an organization that's made up of other organizations, which creates lots of challenges around a kind of common um, identity, um, questions around autonomy and also the authority of the organization as well as its um, affiliates. And there's been quite a lot written around a, a potential evolution of global, global union federations away from the kind of tree-like bureaucracies, which is why I've got these images on the right-hand side, um, to these more kind of rhizo, if that's a way to pronounce it, rhizomatic kind of organizations as Evans talks about, as, as GUF's trying to hold together this kind of decentralized network of, of activists. And Sid Tarot talks about um, international unions perhaps helping to form some form of kind of coral reef of horizontal connections among different, um, different activists. Um, and GUF's face kind of two identity challenges really, which is as, as Franny and Zhang talk about the, the interunion coordination, where you've got all these different affiliates that have very deep histories, different contexts, values, and priorities, which might 
undermine the unity of a global union federation, um, but also inter-union coordination as well, where, you know, for, for a GUF to kind of be successful, it's got to create a link between the GUF itself and, and one or more of, uh, one or more kind of step remove these, these different members to try and mobilize them around these global actions. Now, there's been quite a vast literature on kind of questions around union identity, but little we would argue on the kind of identities of transnational unionists. Um, so let's take sort of the challenges of a global union federation in trying to promote better work. Here we've got the ITF, the International Transport Workers Federation, and a kind of potentially a sort of a somewhat maybe crude diagram here, trying to show the kind of different strategic action fields in which the ITF operates, right? So first they've got to They've got to organize their own organization around the different kind of um, regional structures of, of the organization, ET, uh, ETF, IDF Africa, et cetera, but also involve a wide plethora of different um, affiliates with different identities, ideas, and histories around um, particular campaigns, which might involve some affiliates other than others. And they've got to be responsive there also to demands being placed on their time, often in a, in a, in a, you know, in a real time fax, as we've seen, for example, with with, with P&O uh, ferries if people have been following that um, in the UK. Um, but they're also involved in multiple different kind of arenas at, at different levels, depending on what the campaigns are and the targets which the, the GUF is trying to put pressure on, right? So my, myself and Pete's work with air traffic controllers, you know, if, if the campaign is around um, better, uh, better labor rights in air traffic controllers that at the EU level, then you're gonna have different arenas in which the Global Union Federation is trying to put pressure on. Um, if it's a more international level, then they need to also put pressure on organizations like ICAO, for example. Um, and you've also got traditional arenas which, which GUFs operate in, like, for example, the, the ILO, through various different sectoral meetings and international meetings through the, through the, um, through the ILC. So there's lots of strategic action fields which these these actors are working in and each each one of them has a kind of a, a set of kind of common understandings about the purpose of that of that field the relationships in the field between all the, the different kind of actors that are involved but also the the power relationships and and why there is those power relationships so if you think about the ILO for example where you've seen the expanding power increasing power of the employers in the ILO um, that would be, be very different from a non-tripartite institution, for example. Maybe some regional blocks are more important in some arenas uh, rather than others. But also they've got to understand the, the rules of the field as well, the kind of the rules of the game and participating in these different um, arenas. So in this project, we want to kind of unpack these, these organizations and you know, taking on the kind of Fligstein and McAdam uh, metaphor of trying to open up the strategic action field of international industrial relations. And within that, there's going to, like a Russian doll, there's going to be another strategic action field within that, another, another, try and really drill down on these different fields and how they kind of um, interact. So we want to look inside the kind of black box here of these, of these labor organizations and focus down on who are these transnational labor activists. Now, we're, at the moment, we're kind of drawing on the work of, of Sid Taro and the kind of concept of, of of rooted cosmopolitans as a way to understand how these actors transcend uh, national uh, boundaries and how they kind of um, uh, you know, focus on a range of different history, uh, issues at different sites of, of activism. So our argument here is it's about these unionists whose kind of primary ties might be domestic, but they're obviously part of a kind of wide labor movement, which perhaps creates conflict and contestation within their, um, within their, their, their role. And the, their kind of capacity then to mediate these different, um, these different roles. Um, and they're also institutional entrepreneurs. So we've been doing, uh, reading a bit up on that as well, but they're, they're institutional entrepreneurs, but they're also part of these kind of wider epistemic communities of shared values, argumentation, and communities of practice. And the question is about how do they frame collective action in these different strategic action fields on a range of different issues across these different sites of activism. So um, here's a kind of bit of methodology with the kind we're kind of using for the project at the moment. Myself and Pete have, have done some kind of um, sort of activist research in the past, and we've written recently uh, on that, the kind of some of the challenges of that of doing, of working with the European Transport Workers um, Federation. 
Um, and at the moment, we're kind of having a look at the kind of an analysis of, of websites and social media posts as a way to identify particular campaigns that we might want to drill down into to understand how these union activists mediate these different identities and work within these different strategic action fields, but also about the historical analysis of decision making within these organizations. And then going on further than that, trying to kind of really understand what goes on inside the heads of, of these unionists. You know, how do they define and understand their role? And how do they define and understand um, other stakeholders? And now kind of COVID's lifted. Um, well, it's obviously not gone away completely, but you can travel a bit more. Um, also be able to go and observe some of these inter international meetings as well. So this is kind of where we are sort of at the moment, some of our sort of initial findings. And we, you know, this is based on a long history of working with organizations like the ITF and ETF and working with the ILO and organizations like that um, before. And we've kind of been drawing on, on Hyman's work back in 2005 on the shifting dynamics in international trade unionism, where he identified three models of kind of international trade unionism, the, the, the agitator, the bureaucrat um, and, and the diplomat. And, from our kind of uh, our, our readings and also our understandings and, and talking to a lot of these people is that, that these international unionists adopt these different roles of sometimes at the same time, but also at different times, depending on the kind of strategic action field in which they're trying to, to, to act. So they almost, you know, they, they could be these kind of different forms are uh, could be seen as kind of costumes that they put on during kind of occasional uh, interactions in different strategic action fields, or they might become kind of more permanent parts of their identities, perhaps perhaps over time. But there's conflict here between these different roles, um, conflict perhaps between uh, an individual who sees themselves as, a, as an agitator, but then has to go to an international meeting at the ILO, for example, and has to act in a much more kind of diplomatic way. Or the also the interaction between different unionists working on, on the same project, where you might have someone who's more of a more of a diplomat or a bureaucrat trying to work together with more kind of agitators and maybe that creates then conflict in those roles um, as well and we're not trying to suggest that one is kind of disappearing and and you know and one is becoming more more prevalent you know there's still a lot of career bureaucrats in these central hierarchical organizations but you have seen um and Sarkar and Kura Villa talked about this in a, in a recent paper in BJR about these new forms of, of the kind of agitator model as there's been these kind of new sort of decentralized networks, new generation of activists that are much more sort of campaign um, orientated. And we don't really know this for sure, but at least some of our initial discussions is that perhaps there's a career progression here between a more agitator model that might be a bit more nationally focused as, as unions progress over time, they adopt a more kind of diplomat focus as their kind of career sort of progresses. Um, and so some of these kind of labor activists have become permanently, kind of permanently internationally active as a diplomat, but others continue to maybe operate on a more kind of native ground on, on behalf of, of some workers um, somewhere. Um, so I've only got about a minute left. So what's our kind of next steps? Um, well, we're kind of arguing that our, our sort of understanding of the flows and the kind of dynamics between these transnational labor activists and their organizations across different scales and different arenas seems to be still quite limited. The focus has much been much more been on, on kind of individual organizations rather than the actors within these organizations. Um, so we're looking at um, uh, the, the, the IUF and the ITF as two um, global union federations and then their, uh, their European kind of counterparts um, as well and how and they also uh, you know, interact in different, in different arenas, how they transcend um, different levels and also as the kind of ILO is the kind of central um, actor within the strategic action field of international industrial relations and and obviously the, it's an interesting case because you've got the ITF that perhaps relies on different forms of action for example more kind of global collective bargaining versus IUF that is much more focusing on kind of some of that coalition um, building elements as well. Um, so we're still really early on in the project and I'm looking forward to hearing everyone else's presentations because people are doing some really interesting stuff out there. So uh, I'm not sure if you're taking questions now, Kevin, or whether you're taking them at the end of the presentations, but we look forward to any questions or comments that you have on this project at its very uh, sort of early, early stage. And um, so thanks very much. <laughs>